No, I want you to hear those words. Do not love. It's a command, which means that if we violate it, that we're in sin. In other words, love can be sinful. Remember, I told you this is an important word for our day. Love can be sinful. We live in the midst of a culture that needs to hear that. It needs to hear that from us. Because it's, it's coming at us with this whole love is love mentality. And, and how can you be against love? Nobody can be against love. Certainly Christians can't be against love because God is love and we are called to love. Therefore, how can you stand in the way of any two people who love one another? This issue of love being sinful. The question is, what makes love sinful? What could possibly make love sinful? Under what circumstances would love be considered sinful? Well, first of all, love becomes sinful when it is directed at the wrong object. Love becomes sinful when it is directed at the wrong object. Look at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not love the world. Now it's very important to note that this word world, especially in Johannine literature, is used in at least three different ways. First of all, the world can refer to all creation. You see this in John 1, John 3, John 4, John 6, John 7, John 8, over and over again. This word cosmos refers to all the world, to all the created universe. John is not saying here that we should not love this universe, this world, this earth that God created. That's not what's being said here. Secondly, the term world refers to the people that inhabit this world that God created. And God is not saying, do not love people, do not love mankind. Absolutely not. We, 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 we know that it doesn't mean that. Because of the love that we're called to give, even to our enemies, the, the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So John can't be talking about that first world here and he can't be talking about that second world here. That would be a contradiction. However, there is a third use of the term world. And that third use refers to the spiritual realm that is in opposition to God and in rebellion against his kingdom. It is that third sense of world that is being discussed here. So when John says, do not love the world, he, he says your love becomes sinful when it's directed at that system that is anti-God, that system that is anti-kingdom, that system that is satanic. And he makes it obvious that it's satanic because he uses it several times here, even in 1 John. John writes that by faith, the Christian is able to overcome the world in 1 John 5, 4 and 5. In our text, he says the world passes away. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says the world is ignorant of God. In 3.13, he says the world hates believers. In 4.1, he says it's the abode of false prophets. And 4.3, it's the abode of the Antichrist. And in 4.5, it's the abode of unbelievers. And last, the whole world is controlled by the evil one. It is obvious here that when John refers to world in this text, he's referring to that world that is under the control of our adversary, the devil. 
that world that is spiritual and ideo ideological and at war with our king and his kingdom. And we are told, do not love that world. Not at all. Listen to Calvin. He had said before that the only rule for living religiously is to love God. But as when we are occupied with the vain love of the world, we turn away all our thoughts and affections another way. This vanity must first be torn away from us in order that the love of God may reign within us. Until our minds are cleansed, the former doctrine may be iterated a hundred times, but with no effect. It will be like pouring water on a ball. You can gather no, not a drop, because there is no empty place to retain the water. Like pouring water on a ball. When, when your affections, when your love is pointed toward the world, there is no room for the love of God. Because when your love and your affections are pointed toward the world, they are pointed toward that which opposes God. Thus love can become sinful when it is directed at the wrong object. James says something similar in James 4, in verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. No man can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other. This is an either or situation. You cannot love the world and love God simultaneously. In fact, in our regeneration, in, in, in our salvation, we are taken out of the world. We're taken out of that system. We're brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We transfer kingdoms. We transfer allegiances. But if our love is still for the world, our allegiance has not legitimately been transferred. Love becomes sinful when it arises from the wrong source. Not only when it's, when it's pointed in the wrong direction, pointed toward the wrong object, but when it arises from the wrong source. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. So, so there's a problem first with the object, and now here there's a problem with the source. That, that this love for the world arises from the world. Just like our love for God and for the things of God arises from God. It is God who gives us the capacity to love God. But here we have a love that is arising from a different source. The first two categories that are mentioned here cravings and lust are sinful desires. Boasting, however, is sinful behavior from internal to external. The first two are internal and hidden sins. The last one is revealed. The first two pertain to the individual person. The last one pertains to this person in community with others. Kistemacher says, three categories, cravings, lust, and boasting. 
So our love can become sinful based on its direction and based on its source. But finally, and ultimately, and most importantly, our love becomes sinful when it produces the wrong fruit. When it leads to the wrong ends. Look at verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Here you have these, these, these two opposite ends. On the one hand, you have this world that is passing away. And on the other hand, you have our God who abides forever. Love becomes sinful when it leads to wrong ends and produces wrong fruit. Our passions become sinful when they are pointed in directions that lead to death and destruction as opposed to leading to life. The poignant way in which this is so pertinent to our times because of the love is love crowd, particularly in the area of same-sex marriage. How can you be opposed to same-sex marriage when same-sex marriage is just about people who love each other being allowed to express that love? But that's a love that's pointed at the wrong object. That is not a love that comes from God or that brings glory and honor to God. It is pointed at the wrong object. It is a love that arises from the wrong source. Look with me, if you will, at Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity. Here we are. These lusts, these desires to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Dishonorable passions. The desires themselves are dishonorable. Enough already with this gay Christian stuff. And, and I don't just say enough already. I, I don't mean this in the sense of, you know, they're over there and I'm over here. I mean this in the, in, in the pastoral sense. How cruel is that? If a man comes to me talking about a desire for a woman who is not his wife, I'm not going to tell him to just go ahead and embrace the desire because the desire in and of itself is okay. It's not. God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged the natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. 
And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. There is the bad fruit. It's pointed in the wrong direction. It is arising from the wrong source. And it is producing bad fruit. Therefore, it falls into the category of love that is sinful. It falls into the category of love that does not glorify God. It falls into the category of love for that third version of the word world. Not the first. God's created order, not the second. People in the world. But that third, that system that is openly opposed to all that God is. And that rebels against the reign of God and his kingdom. And that is precisely where we are, brothers and sisters. And not only that, this rebellion is no longer covert, but it has become overt. It is out there and it is in our faces and unfortunately it is being urged along by people within the church. Who are essentially arguing that love is always righteous. Love is always godly. Love is always appropriate because God loves everyone and God loves everything. And right here, the Bible says, do not love. There are some loves that are out of bounds. There are some loves that are unacceptable. In other words, there are some loves that are not truly love. And if you're here today and you, you wrestle with that, let me say to you, that the last thing you need to do is to give in to that love and define yourself by it. Because that's love of the world. Do not love the world. Do not love based on your passions and your desires. But love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, which means your passions are to be turned in his direction and no other. We must reject the lie that says there is no love that is out of bounds. Because ultimately, that lie that says there is no love that's out of bounds is a lie that says there is no truth in God. I'm a father nine times over. And what that means is I am very well acquainted with the fact that love is not defined by allowing those 
whom you love to have what they want when they want it just because they want it. Some of the most loving moments between me and my children have been moments when I have said authoritatively and unequivocally, no. Amen. And we see that here in this text. Why? We'll end with this. Look at it again. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do you see what's happening here? This do not love the world is not God saying, listen, there's good stuff out there that I want to keep from you. That's the lie of the serpent. This do not love says that looks good to you and may even feel good to you. But in the end, you will perish. I'm calling you away from it because I actually do love you. And in loving you, I want you to abide in God, to remain in God and to not perish. Because our desire is that Christ indeed may have the fullness of the reward for which he died. So do not love the world.